Hey everybody, in this video I'm going to talk about the AIM-9 Sidewinder missile, talk about its history, its development, how they work, and also have a look at some real parts. Yes, this is a genuine AIM-9 Sidewinder missile fin with working roller on, uh, and six years ago I made a video talking about this, specifically about the roller on. It is an air-powered, gyroscopically stabilising device for the missile. It is amazing how it works, and I'll talk more about that in this video. As I say, I made that first video about six years ago and it got a few views, but uh, a few weeks ago the channel Curious Droid made a video talking about the A9 Sidewinder and the roller on, and uh, my video was suggested quite a lot, and lots of people came in and saw the video and absolutely loved it, which is fantastic. Uh, because I knew there was a lot of people that would be interested in it, but because my channel is mainly motorcycle focused, uh, YouTube doesn't want to give that to the same group of people, you know, it doesn't spread it to everyone, it's kind of my bubble which means that videos that I do on this sort of subject normally do very poorly. But, because there was that interest there, and because over the past couple of years I've gained oh, another part, this is one of the front canards off an AIM-9, yes again, a real one, and I've also got this little model, I also know a bit more history, and I also know a bit more about how this works, I thought why don't I do a video talking about the history, correcting some of the stuff that I got wrong in the past, talk about how the guidance system on this works, then we're going to have another go at spinning this thing up and trying to get the RPM off it using harmonic frequency um, and some maths, and then I'm going to open this thing up and have a look inside. I've wanted to do that since the day I owned this, but I was never able to get inside. Okay, so let's start with the history. The AIM-9 name has lots of different uh, numbers after it. This is an AIM-9B, I believe. Uh, the AIM-9 series started a very long time ago and is probably still going to be used up to about 2055, but obviously there's been lots of developments along the way. They're still called AIM-9s, but they get a, uh, a prefix at the end um, of a letter to let you know what one's what. So the way this missile came around was around 1945, planes were using rockets uh, to shoot down other planes and things like that, which were just, you know, a rocket. You fired it at something and you hoped that it was nearby when it got there. Uh, there was no guidance, it didn't follow the target, it was just kind of guess, hope he's there, fire. Now when William McLean was first doing this research, he wasn't intending to make a missile necessarily, he was working on a heat detection unit as it were, a, a sensor that could pick up IR radiation, as in heat, from something. And it was only over time, uh, and a very interesting story, that this thing got developed into the first heat-seeking missile. A true missile in the sense that it's not a rocket, because it actually is guided. Now, unlucky for me, when I made my first video, there wasn't this documentary on YouTube, which was only uploaded about nine months ago, talking about the de early development of the Sidewinder. So I had to go off of what I could find in written information. I did get a few things wrong. Uh, thankfully, now that documentary's come out, Curious Droid's also done work, and I've taken a few bits of information from his video, so thank you very much, and go and check out his channel. Uh, and also thanks, as I say, for bringing some people over here. Because of that, and time passed and stuff, I have some more accurate information on its development. So... Uh, as I say, it was about 1946 that he was working on the technology of this heat sensor, and this is where you could watch that documentary, or watch it after this video, uh, talking about the history in more depth. But I'll give you a, a slight overview uh, of what happened then. Basically, he was working on the missile, then the development got stopped because someone else was working on a similar missile, uh, but they continued working on it, in the background as a side project which they're allowed to do. Then by 1952 it gets its Sidewinder name. Now the reason why it's called a Sidewinder is because where this was developed at China Lake in the Mojave Desert there is a snake called a horned rattlesnake and that snake is a, also known as a Sidewinder and it is a pit viper which means it can detect heat with its face and then it attacks. So it is a, as you know, a simile uh, for what this missile does, the fact that it does detect heat. It's just interesting that snake is actually you know found in the place that this was developed. So by 1952 it gets that Sidewinder name uh, and it was put into some testing with some other missiles that are in development. They basically were awful. This thing was amazing. And so, in time, it became the missile that everyone was using in the Navy. Uh, and in the end, I think 28 nations end up making this. But I'll continue along the storyline. So in 1958 this saw its first use in combat uh, and got its first kills. They were being fired by the Republic of China um, at the Soviet planes that had been supplied to communist China. Um, and basically that's where it's got its first kills. During that time, an interesting thing happened that one of the uh, missiles embedded itself into one of the communist planes, but it didn't go off. They flew back home with it, 
The Chinese then gave it to the Soviets, who reversed engineered it and made their own. And that's why the Russians have got a very similar version. Uh, they basically nicked the idea. It's still in use now, even though it's been updated multiple times, and it will be in use for decades to come. In the time they've been producing it, they've made about 110,000 of them between the US and 27 other nations. And it's proven to be the most effective um, air-to-air -air missile with 271 kills that's basically ever been made. So it was a fantastic success, a very interesting story, and a very clever piece of engineering and technology. Right at the beginning, everything was new on this pretty much. Obviously this is a little 3D printed model uh, that one of my subscribers very kindly printed for me and then I painted up. There actually is a video of me painting this thing. Uh, it's not a good job, it was just to make it look better than the uh, black plastic it was when it came. This is about a 1 in 64th scale. The missile is around 3 metres long. Um, I've seen it quoted as 3 metres a few places but I think it's actually more like 2.8 metres. That's 9 feet 11 in Freedom Eagles and it had a 5 inch body that is 127 millimetres, so 12 and a bit centimetre. Uh, diameter body and they weigh around 85 kilos um, that's about 188 pounds roughly I say I'm talking generally here because the thing is aim 9 is one missile but there are so many subcategories of this missile that the, the numbers will vary between which one you look at as does the cost I've seen quotes of between 60 and 70 thousand dollars per missile up to 400 thousand dollars per missile but I think that's probably the more recent aim nines which don't use the heat seeking module i believe they have a semi-active radar radar guided system uh, which probably adds to the cost i'm not in the military i don't know for definite i can only go with the information that i find online okay so let's explain how this thing actually worked using my non-patented plastic pokey so in the front of the missile here you have the ir sensor that basically picks up the heat signature from the plane in front. There's a lot more detail to that and I suggest watching documentaries explaining it because it's, it's very interesting. But just know there is something in the front of this which is letting the missile know where the heat signature is. Uh, it is like the mechanical pigeon, you might say. So a reference to the pigeon bomb where they literally tapped on a screen uh, to try and hit ships with the eye. This was an idea of a bomb, they never used one. Put a pigeon in a bomb, it would tap on a screen because it'd been trained to tap on pictures of uh, ships and get food for it. So it'd go tap, 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 oh, there is a ship. And as it gets closer and closer, it'd keep tapping, which would guide the bomb in to hit the target, which obviously works uh, when the thing's slow moving, um, but when it's air to air, it might be a bit tricky. So I'm not sure they'd want to do that. A fly though, if they could get a fly to do it, that would have such quick reactions. Anyway, should we get on to something a bit more serious? Uh, so basically that then tells these fins at the front here which way they need to turn to keep lock on that signal. These are called canards. This is, as I say, a real canard from an A9 Sidewinder missile. It is made of a type of alloy metal. There you go, there's the markings on it. So this is a Euro one from the looks of it. Forward. There is uh, more numbers under here. And it's got this strange matte coating to it that I don't think it's oxidisation. I have a theory, and this is completely me just like putting it out there. I reckon they make this a rough texture because by doing that, uh, it causes a, a surface of air to stick to it, which means the next layer of air rolls over it faster and it can um, reduce aerodynamic drag. This thing is supersonic. Um, it does do, well, depending on which model you're looking at, 1.7 to 2.5 Mach. Uh, so fast. That bit is completely me surmising so don't take that as if it's out of a book but if anyone could confirm that that would be interesting. So they're mounted onto the missile as you can see with a key which keeps it in line, two screws and they can pivot like so. Uh, let's do it that way it makes more sense. You can see pivot, we'll get it in the middle, pivot, pivot, pivot. So our mechanical pigeon snake eye is seeking out the heat from the plane, or whatever they're firing at, because I think these might... I don't know if these are anti-missile missile. If it was a slow big missile, maybe. Anyway, moving on. Uh, it'll then turn the canards. Now, I can't tell if these are all independent or they're in pairs exactly. I imagine they might be independent, because they might want to turn in, in opposite directions. But the point is, all of these fins, canards, turn right at the front of the missile which really directs where the front of the missile goes so it's you know if you steer something from the back it's going to kind of do like a boat-ish boat -ish action if you steer it from the front it's really going to move around fast uh, and for that reason 
in the early days, you had to be line of sight kind of thing with these, that you have to be behind the plane, fire it, and it will go and hit that plane. But if they were going the opposite direction, you couldn't do that. They made these eventually so you can fire at a plane and it'll do a U-turn in the air and go straight back after them. Uh, quite amazing. Now, coming back a bit, we actually have the payload, which is going to damage the plane, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, behind that, we have the rocket motor itself, which is a solid-state rocket motor, and it's actually got a, a hot gas turbine in it, which helps power the electronics for the missile. So it's powered by itself. So once it goes, it gets its own power. Uh, so the obviously the thrust comes out the back here and then we have these stabilizing fins and then in the corners of the, the stabilizing fins, these things, we have the roller on, which I'll show you is a gyroscopically air driven sorry, an air driven gyroscope gyroscope wheel which gyroscopically stabilizes the missile passively. As in you don't have to do anything, it does it itself. I think that's the right use of passive. Now these don't hit the plane they're fired at, they get close to it and then they explode. Now the more modern ones have an explosive and some shrapnel basically, so it gets next to wherever it's trying to hit, fires a load of shrapnel at it, which will obviously, it could kill the pilot, it could damage the engines, take out hydraulic lines, do severe damage to a plane uh, and take it out of action, etc. In the early days, oh my god this thing's amazing, they made a titanium continuous annular ring, which was basically this like basket looking thing with, ch uh, with cuts through it, which when they fired it expanded like this, so it's a ring of titanium. The idea is that it gets bigger and bigger, and if it catches a plane it's just going to chop a wing off or something like that. Um, they did obviously replace that eventually because you have to hit it with that ring opposed to having a shower or shotgun effect, as it were, from having the fragmentation stuff. So although it's kind of cool to think of this giant ring, it wasn't very effective. So it really is that simple. The motor goes, which powers the electronics, our little eye finds the heat, the fins control the direction, uh, the long body helps stabilise it, the fins at the back help stabilise it, and then you have the roller rods that help stabilise the rear, and it shoots along at great speed and explodes and hits its target. And as I say, incredibly effective. So this is the roller on, this is its pivot, this is the wheel that spins. Sorry it's a bit dark at the moment, it's because it's so shiny. And on the back here we've got a catch which, to my understanding, at the force of the rocket missile being fired, pops out like this which releases the roller on. So you see here, it's very firmly locked in place. A little pull on this, and then it pivots. It doesn't turn side to side, it pivots in this sort of arc. You can see these two jaws here help force air in onto the wheel and this spins and obviously with the gyroscopic force or should we say centrifugal force giving you a gyroscopic force um, of this wheel and its weight because it's very heavy as this as the missile body wants to turn this is going to try and remain straight okay is, I, I, you can physically see it in action I'll show you in a minute when I spin it up uh, but the first thing I want to try and do and there isn't much science to this, apart from the fact that I can work out how fast it's spinning here, is I'm going to spin this up with an airline so you can hear it, and you can see how fast this thing goes. Uh, and then I'm going to use an app which is going to take the frequency of that noise, and then divide it by 24, which is how many teeth we have, and I should be able to get our RPM. So let's do that now, because trust me, this thing's a bit nuts. It's quite scary when it starts spinning up, and I know you're thinking, oh yeah, yeah, just, yeah just wait. So what I've got here is about 100 psi of air. I've got it as hard as I can make it come out on a small nozzle. Now I tried to do some maths to work out what the psi of air hitting this sort of square inch here would be. Um, and it came up as like 30 at sea level and like 2 at about 20,000 feet. So I don't know if I've got that wrong or not. Um, so ignore those figures so I'm not quoting them. But let's just do this. Are you ready?
Okay, the total spin time down was this on your screen. It's a long time. Uh, keep in mind, this thing is old. It's been sat around, you know, in dusty places. This is the first time it's been spun up. Well, second time it's spun up in like six years. It still sounds pretty scary. Okay, it's a bit tricky to know which peak to use, but it looked like the highest one was peaking at around 15,000 hertz-ish. It did go a little bit higher at times, but let's say 15,000. If it was that, what we then do is divide 15,000 hertz by 24, which is the number of teeth. We then times that by 60, which gives us our RPM, and it's giving us a suggested RPM of 37,000 and a half. Um, unfortunately, because I don't know if it was one of the lower peaks, it could be much slower than that. If it was one of the lower peaks, around 6,000, that's going to come out at 15,000. So, I have heard the second peak's the more reliable one. But the problem is there's 24 peaks, because you get a peak, a harmonic peak for each tooth. And it's knowing which one to choose, as I understand it. Um, but yeah. If, if any of you know about that, you've got the data on your screen, you can probably work it out. Um, suggestions in the comments. Now, I'll spin it up again and I'll show you uh, its gyroscopic function. This does seem to be a little bit stiff in one direction now. Um, this pivot does feel like it's got some sort of fluid or resistance to it, because you can see it's it's dampened. Um, however, you could see how when you twist the fin out of the way, it just wants to stay in the same place and stay straight, and that helps in turn stabilise the missile itself. And obviously the missile has four of these, one for each fin realized I'm now going to attempt to undo these ones because I've tried all the others but I haven't done these ones Now that should lift off. Ah, no, no, no. That won't quite come off. That pin doesn't seem to want to move if it is a removable pin. So I'm going to sort of do the cheat way, which is I'm going to deconstruct the side of it, which will get the casing out of the way for me anyway. I haven't seen a single picture online of inside one of these. So in theory, in theory is always a wonderful thing. Oh, now that's loose from there. But again, that won't come off, but will this now? Yes, right, okay, so we've now got this piece off. Ah, the damper does not want to let go of it. Hold on a minute, I've just noticed that looks like a pin. But looking at the way that looks uneven, I'm wondering whether they're threaded and they snap them like security screws. Oh, I think we're okay. I don't think they're threaded. I think they are just alignment pins. So you can see, I've got the pins out far enough so they're not engaging on the other side. Um, and if I try and flex this here, it does flex at the bottom, but it's not opening at the top. Uh, but if you try and 
bend it open here, you can see it flexes. I'm not going to be able to get these two halves apart because if you remember there was that pink sealant stuff. Well basically that's just a sealant over what looks like some sort of bearing and I think this is fitted, press fitted between these two. That's how they don't have any movement um, side to side. So I think this is permanently fixed together. Uh, not that I think we're going to discover anything in here that interesting other than a cutout for the wheel. Um, this hydraulic part here, I can't, act, this Allen at the top won't undo. Um, this won't slide off. This pit won't come out. But what we can see just in here is there's like a round, um, it might even be a key to try and keep it in the right place, but it's just interesting. Maybe it's a weight I would have liked to have got in there. But as you can see, you just can't, you just can't. So unfortunately, I think it's going to keep its secrets inside, but I think we've probably seen most of them by now. So there we go, all back together. You just have to press this pin, and then we can click the latch up. And there you go. So yeah, it's a shame I couldn't get inside there, but I want to keep this. I don't want to damage it, you know, um, for the sake of seeing inside what's inside there, and we pretty much can guess it anyway. This does feel like it's got some dampening in it, and I can't work out if that's a fluid thing or what. There is four screws in the back of it, which might be tension of some sort so there you go there is my update and probably the last video that i'll ever do on the sidewinder missile because what else can i tell you uh, if you found this video interesting uh please remember to hit that like button i'd appreciate it there are some other videos that i've got on things a bit like this you might be interested in um i'll link them uh, as the cards at the end but there's one called the man with big boots which is to do with a part that i got for a tornado fighter jet um, fighter bomber should we say being a tornado uh, and it was a, a story of trying to find out what that thing did that then led me to talking to people from the RAF which then got people from the RAF to talk to people from the other like old people they worked with back in the day they hadn't spoke to in years got them back in contact um, it was a really nice story and really interesting to find out what that thing was so if you're interested in that links are at the end of the video as i say uh thanks to curious droid his short video that he uploaded that brought the attention to my video uh, i'll put in the description i'll also put that documentary about the sidewinder and there is a third video that explains how uh, mechanically with some nice cutaways how the missile guidance system everything works uh, which is quite nice but there we go thank you for watching catch you next time Bye bye